Father, we do uh, just lift up this time and ask God that you would speak to us. Lord, we want to understand you. We want to fall more in love with you. And as we just are able to kind of eavesdrop into this conversation that Jesus is having with the uh, Pharisees and the, and the unbelieving Jews, Lord, I pray that it would impact our lives, impact our hearts. So God, give us insight and open us up to receive what you have for us. And we pray, for the, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we get into this, remember Jesus healed a blind guy. The Pharisees got upset. They've had some conversations. And at the end of the last conversation, the Jews had asked him if they're blind also. Now Jesus is gonna continue that discussion. So it's kind of sad there's a chapter break and we think you know, one ended and the other started. I think this is all part of that same scene. So Jesus is gonna talk to them about shepherding. Now the people of Israel should have been familiar with that and the analogies in, in the Psalms and Isaiah and Ezekiel, Jeremiah, it all talks about God's people being sheep and needing shepherds. So they've heard a lot about it. So a little bit, I think we need a little bit of information on first century shepherding. Yeah, I don't think it's like what we do in North America and, and even maybe things have changed over the centuries. But when they would shepherd, the shepherd was intimately involved with his sheep. And we need to know that. Some say they even named their sheep. They would name them by characteristics they had. Like if one had a long nose, they would call him long nose. If another one was short, they'd call him shorty. Another one had extra wool, they'd call him hairy. And they would name him that way and have this, this intimacy. And it's interesting when you think about that because Jesus renamed some of us according to our characteristics and what he sees. And that's kind of a blessing. I think, I think that's kind of great. So listen, we do that. So they had the sheep and they would often put their sheep in, in uh, sheep pens. And if they were in a city, and a lot of people would bring all their sheep in and leave them there. And you would have one main doorkeeper. And then when you would go get your sheep, you would check in with him and you would go in, call your sheep by their names, because they knew their names. And they would kind of do a, a melody with it. And the sheep knew who the shepherd was. And it was interesting. They would have many flocks in there and the one flock would follow that shepherd and go out with them. So kind of interesting stuff. And we're going to talk later on, when they were out in the country, they would have little corrals, they would put them in, and the shepherd would lay across and be the door, and the sheep wouldn't cross him because he's the shepherd. So, you know, just some information there that we don't, aren't privy to, but they would have been. And so now Jesus is going to use some of those analogies, talking about what's going on with this blind guy. Remember, the blind guy is kind of the thing and how they treated him and what they did to him. So, verse one, it says, most assuredly, what does that mean? You guys have been around enough, right? That means listen up, pay attention, you know, hear what I'm saying. I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So he's talking about people coming in, I guess, trying to steal sheep. But it's interesting, one guy said in, in the stuff I was reading that he even put on the shepherd's clothes, learned the sheep's name, and went in and called them and they wouldn't follow him. Because they know, they know. So these guys would climb in, but he says they were thieves and robbers. You guys know who he's talking about, right? He's talking about the Pharisees, right? And he's saying, hey, there were thieves and robbers. That's kind of heavy. Thieves were ones who came in and used deception and conniving in ways to get your money. Robbers were ones who came in very aggressive and violent to get. So he's talking about, you know, different groups of people. But he's saying, hey, they were, and he says, listen, but the shepherd comes in by the door, the shepherd knows he's not ashamed. He comes in, and he's known by the doorkeeper. Then he says this. Uh, verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name 
and leads them out. So again, using that illustration, so there's a difference between the false shepherd and the good shepherd. And that's what Jesus is letting us know. For our homework, you can read Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel talks a lot about the false shepherds of the day. So it's not, it's not like a new concept. They should have, they understood what Jesus was saying, and I think they really got a hold of, he's talking about us, he's talking about me. So Jesus says they call him by name. I kind of like that. I like the idea that Jesus can call us by name. He knows us we follow him that sense of intimacy and closeness is what jesus is talking about so they have that going on and then he says this verse four and when he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him and know his voice much different than hey we're we're out west we're cowboys right and cowboys drive cattle and push them shepherds lead sheep and the sheep follow him. And I think that's important. And he says, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus laid all this out. He's kind of laying groundwork because he wants to tell them something. He wants to tell these Pharisees that they're wrong and that they're trying to rip people off. So he lays out the groundwork here and, and starts the whole teaching. And then he says, or John tells us in verse six, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. So some of your translations might say parable. I don't think this was a parable. If you're doing a Bible reading, we just went through the parables in, in Matthew, and if you're not doing a Bible reading, you need to be doing the Bible reading so you can uh, you know, get through the Bible in a year, but we just went through the parables. This is not, I don't think this is a parable. It's an illustration, no doubt. And it's allegory that Jesus is trying to get them to think about exactly what they're doing and how they're acting. And when it says they didn't understand, I think what's happening is they didn't want to understand. You know, sometimes you hear something and it kind of hits you and you go, I don't know what you're talking about. Because you don't want to admit that's you, right? You don't want to get to that place. So John tells us that now, in verse seven, he says, then Jesus spoke to them again, most assuredly. So once again, pay attention, right? I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now he changes a little bit, right? He's a shepherd, and now he's the door, and some people say, is Jesus getting mixed up? No, like I said, when they were out in the country, and they were out on the hillside, and they didn't come in at night, they had to corral the sheep. And they put him in that corral, and the shepherd would be the door. He would literally lay across there. Now, I think Jesus is talking about that, but he's going to get much more intimate in a minute. But he tells them, listen, I am the door. Do you know that Jesus has used that a lot in the book of John? I am the bread of life, right? I am the light of the world. And then he did the great I am, period. And then now here he's saying, I am the door. And we need to know something. There's no other way into the sheep pen except through Jesus Christ, right? He's, he's the way in. He's the way for us. So we need to know that. He's the door that we go through to get in, and there's no other way. He didn't say, I am a door. He said, I am the door. And kind of keep that in mind. So he lets them know, and then he says this, and I all who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That's pretty intense, right? He's letting them know once again, I'm talking about you guys. I'm talking about the Pharisees and all who came before me. Now listen, I don't think he's talking about all the patriarchs, right, or the prophets. He's talking about every false shepherd, every false teacher, and I think specifically, He's talking about the Pharisees, and he's calling them thieves and robbers. Listen to some of the things that Jesus says to the Pharisees. In Luke 6, I'm sorry, Luke 16, he says they were covetousness, they, they were covet, they were greedy, they were people wanting money. In Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 12, he says, and he talks about them taking advantage of the poor widows and people around them. And then in Matthew 21, he says that they had turned God's house into a den of thieves. 
And then in, in John 11, he's going to talk about them plotting to kill Jesus. They are thieves and robbers, right? And he kind of backed that up. So think about, now think about, if you're a Pharisee standing there, you're going to be like turning a little red right now, right? You'd be a little hot under the collar because he just called you out. And he's not done. Listen, he says they were thieves and robbers. I am the door in verse 9. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. How great that is, right? I mean, you read that and you just kind of want to know that shepherd, right? He's going to take care of you. It's going to be good. But the thief, in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Man, again, that's intense, right? And we think about what we just did, some of those passages we looked at. You need to know that you have an enemy of your soul. And he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when he comes, though, he makes things look so good, right? Sin is inviting, isn't it? Some people say, no, it's not, it's ugly. Why would we do it if it was ugly? Like it's drawing you in. Sin is something that draws you in and you think it's good, and then you get so ripped off by it. And it gets you, and we need to understand. And, you know, I think, I think especially when we're talking to some of the youth, I think it's important to let the youth know, hey, there's an enemy of your soul who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. I know for my daughter at times, when she was especially in those teenage years, and teenagers, it's hard to understand what parents are doing because parents are weird, and you're right. All the teens are saying, Amen. Preach it, bro. But listen, we kind, of, we, kind of, we kind of have that thing going on. And I remember my daughter kind of thinking, Dad, why are you doing this to me? What's the matter with you? Right? Why don't you? And here's what she said. Don't you trust me? And I said, well, I do trust you, kind of. And I said, but there's a thing. I don't trust your hormones, and I don't trust the devil. Because he wants to come into your life and kill steal and destroy and i'm asking you to trust me because i want to protect you i care about you and i don't want to see you get ripped off and that's what he does now listen we can tell teenagers that but some of us need to be reminded of that too when we're enticed by things he comes to it's just going to ruin your life and here's the thing, do you want to go with the good shepherd who's taking you out to green pastures, or do you want to go with the false shepherd who wants to rip you off and take advantage of you? Oh, and then it gets a little bit better. So he, he speaks about those guys, and then he says this, I have come, in the middle of verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Hallelujah, huh? Listen, now that gets ripped off by some of the fake teachers, some of the faith teachers say abundant life is health and wealth. That's not what abundant life is. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, hey, when you live without Jesus, you're just existing. When you live with, with Jesus, you have life, and it's an abundant life. I think of our lives, my wife and I, we got married, uh, uh, we got saved after we got married. We'd been married 13 years when we got saved. And you think your life is good, and then you find Jesus and your life. Listen, not that you get healthy and wealthy. It just gets better. Why? Because you understand life and you have fullness of life. And Jesus is talking about that. And so listen, once again, do you want to get ripped off? Or do you want to go to the green pastures and have abundant life? And that you can really understand. So Jesus lays that out and I'm thinking, wow. And then he says this. I am the good shepherd. Oh, now he's another I am, right? I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And he says, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we know what he's talking about, right? And he's going to bring that up again. He's going to go to the cross. But then he compares himself to the Pharisees, and he says, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep 
and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Now, I know Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about them coming in. But I think it's important even in our day. If you're going into ministry, you need to go into ministry for the right reasons. You shouldn't go into ministry because, you're number one, you're guilt-tripped into it. That's never good. You're not going to last. And you shouldn't go into the ministry seeking a position and seeking, you know, some kind of recognition. You should go into the ministry because you're called. Now, what breaks my heart is a lot of people go into the ministry because they have a certain degree. I have a degree in this, or I have a master's in this, and then, hey, you get a master's, all of a sudden you're a pastor. Getting an education does not make you a shepherd or a pastor. There's nothing wrong with education, but that's not what makes you. What makes you a pastor is a calling from God and God putting a calling on your life no matter what your education is, and you trust the call of God in your life. And hey, when you're gonna do that, and God has called you, you're not looking for recognition, you're not looking for any kind, you, all you wanna do is serve him and serve God's people. And hey, sometimes, sometimes you get paid for it, sometimes you don't. And you know, that's a fact, there's lots of pastors who are bivocational, they have to work at a job to do the ministry and, and you know, they work hard at it. But I think it's important, man, we, we here in this fellowship, we're definitely not hirelings. Almost everyone on staff has taken pay cuts to come on staff. They've come from good paying jobs to come on staff to get okay paying jobs. And listen, I think that's important. I think it's important that we understand that. And if you're doing it for the money, you're not gonna have the right heart. And the first time something difficult comes along, and trust me, there's a lot of difficulties in ministry. Ministry's not always like fun. Sometimes ministry gets ugly and gets hard and gets difficult. And if you're called, you're gonna stay. If you're a hireling, poof, you let the wolves come in, right? So Jesus is comparing himself to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees threw that guy to the wolves, didn't they? The blind guy, hey, when he needed them the most, they threw him out. And so Jesus is letting them know. Now, now it gets even better, if you can get better. He says in verse 14, once again, I am the good shepherd, I love this, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Is that good or what? I know my sheep and they know me. You know his voice. You trust him. You believe him. Even when, listen, even when life gets hard and you don't go the direction you think you're going to go, you can reflect on, I know the Lord and he's guiding me. And he'll get me through this somehow or, you know, we'll, we'll go a different direction. He's going to be part of it and we need to trust him. But he knows you and you know him. And then he compares, check this out. Now I think this is good. He says, I'm known by my sheep, and, and uh, I know my sheep and known by them. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Now before we read the rest of that, think about this. Jesus just said he knows his sheep and his sheep know him, and then he compared that to the relationship he has with the Father, that the Father knows him and he knows the Father. How intimate is that relationship between Jesus and the Father? Think about how long it's been for eternity. That's a long, long relationship, right? Like never ending. And he compares our relationship with him to that. Him and the Father are very intimate. We should be that intimate with Jesus. I love that comparison. That should be our relationship. And we should desire to know him that deeply and that intimately. And then he says, listen, he says, as a father knows me, even so, I've known the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's talking about going to the cross, isn't he? He's letting us know he's going to do anything and everything for the sheep. And as he says that, he lets them know something else. Verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
What's he talking about? He's talking about bringing in the Gentiles, isn't he? Hey, they're not of this fold or they're not of this flock. You know what's bad is sometime early century, early, uh, I think second or third century, they kind of translated that. I have some that are not part of this corral, right, fold, and I'm going to bring others in. And the Roman Catholic Church translated that as there's only one church, and if you're not part of that church, you're on the outside. Now, there is, that is kind of, in a sense, there is only one church, one large family of God, but you don't have to be part of Calvary Chapel to be part of the fold. You have to be born again and be part of the relationship with Jesus. But here's what I love, man. He comes in and we're all one. I mean, look around the room here. Look at the different people we have. And we're all one. What do we have in common? The relationship we have with Jesus Christ. And how great that is. And I'm, I, I praise God for diversity just in life. Man, I would hate everybody to be like me. You know, I think I'd be a drag, right? I mean, just looking at me all the time. And we should feel that. I'm glad. I'm glad we're different. I'm glad we have different thoughts. I'm glad we come from different places. I'm glad we have different ideas. And I'm really glad we dress differently. <laughs> so listen. This is where we're at. So Jesus says, but all of us come together in that one place, in that relationship with him. How good is that? So now he's back to dying. He says, verse 17, therefore, because they're gonna come in, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Oh, Jesus says my father loves me. Why? Because I'm obedient. Think about that. Are you obedient to the call of God in your life? Because I think that's when you realize the love. God loves you anyway, but you realize it and you experience it when you're obedient. No one, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So he knows, listen, Jesus knew from I don't know what age, that he was going to go to the cross. But notice he doesn't say, they took my life. What does he say? I laid my life down. I chose, I made it happen. And some people go, come on, man, they came and arrested him and took him away. Do you remember when they arrested him? Remember when they came and arrested him? And they said, where's Jesus? And he said, I am he. And they all fell down backwards. I think you could have escaped right then, right? Everybody's down. And then he, he even said to Peter, Peter, put your sword away. If I wanted to escape, I could call a legion of angels and they would come and take care of things. So chill out, Peter. Plus he was a bad swordsman, but he's telling him, chill out, right? So listen, Jesus, and then on the cross, what did Jesus say? Father, you know, I give up my spirit. He chose, so he laid down his life. And then, isn't it interesting, what does he say? I lay down my life and I what? I take it up again. Who rose Jesus from the dead? I love to ask Jehovah's Witnesses that question. Who, who was it that rose Jesus from the dead? Well, they'll say Jehovah God, and they'll say you're absolutely right. And then Jesus says, I will take my life up again. Here in John chapter uh, 10, he does it again. I think it's John chapter four, and he talks about him raising himself. So I'm thinking, Jesus is God. Now the interesting thing, do a study, and through the study you find out God the Father is the one who raised him. God the Son, Jesus claims to raise himself. And the Holy Spirit claims to raise Jesus. So what does that tell us? There's three different beings, if you will, or persons that all claim to be God because they claim that, that position. So we have that. So here Jesus is saying that. Now that's a side note. I don't think that, that might have freaked the Pharisees out some. But he kind of, I think here he takes a breath. And it is interesting, way back in the, after he healed the blind guy, these guys ask him a question and Jesus is going, I'm glad you asked. And we're still talking to him. So he lays all that out and it says, therefore, verse 19, therefore, 
there was division among the Jews because of this saying. Here's the thing, when we get real about Jesus, it's always gonna cause division. Those who wanna follow him and those who don't. And it's gonna be that way. And you know, sometimes as Christians, we, we get uptight when people don't wanna believe us or wanna you know, even get a little angry with us and get upset with us. We should understand, not everybody's gonna receive the message. And we should be people, I wanna give the message, and if they receive it, fine. If they don't, fine. I'm just the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you the truth. So it says there was division among them, and I kind of like this. And So verse 20, and many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Now think about, because here's what they just heard. They just heard him claiming certain things that only God would do. And the Jews, the leaders, the Pharisees, naturally would say, that guy is out of his mind. I think you've heard it said, I think it's C.S. Lewis said it, I think somebody else, that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. You gotta draw those conclusions. He's either just an outright liar because he claims certain things, or like these guys, he's a madman because no sane person would say those things, or he's Lord. Now I did hear somebody say, no, we could just say we reject the New Testament. This was a Jew. And they go, no, I don't, think any, I don't think anything in the New Testament is true. And I thought, well, you're a little weird, and I'm not gonna tell you who that was, but his name is Ben Shapiro. But anyway, he just, you know, he just said that, and I thought, well, that was weird. He just like blurted that out that, no, I don't believe the New Testament. And I thought, you're weird. I'd love to have a discussion with him, although he's way smarter than me. But I think I could beat him on that one. So these guys are saying Jesus has a demon or he's a madman. Quit listening to him. You don't want to hear him. Others, listen, there's others there. There, they said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Here's what they're saying. He can't have a demon. Why can't he have a demon? Because he opened, can a demon open the eyes of one blind? Oh, we gotta keep the miracle in mind, right? All of this revolves around that miracle. So we're still talking about the miracle that we started at the beginning of, of uh, chapter nine. And listen, we gotta say, is it true or not? Did it happen or not? These guys know it happened because they were standing there. And here's what they're saying. Ah, he can't be demon possessed because he opened the eyes of a blind. And then the blind man said, he's gotta be from God because he opened my eyes. So now there's that dilemma going on. Now we're gonna stop here and we'll finish this conversation that Jesus is having next week. I like to stop at places where we're kind of And people go, what's the rest of the story? Well, you obviously can read it yourselves. Not while I'm closing, when you go home. But you can read it yourselves. But let's think about, let's think about this. Number one, I think we're all challenged with do you want to go with the good shepherd or do you want to go with thieves and robbers, bottom line? Which way do you want to go? And we need to be people. Hey, I think most of us in here, we want to go with the the good shepherd. Some here today don't have that relationship and they're not sure and they're still trying to decide. I think this is a good time to decide. I think what was laid out for us is pretty phenomenal. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the door, and we learn things. Listen, man, he's gonna give us life, but not just life, he's gonna give us abundant life. It's gonna become real. It's gonna become what life should be. And then on top of that, man, we're gonna go to some good pastures, and he's gonna bring that peace in your heart. That's the reality. So good shepherd or bad shepherds? Life, abundantly, or ripped off. Those are the decisions you make, and here's the thing, it comes down to being that simple. It's either good or bad, and it's very simple to make a choice, and some are going, I, 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 still, don't, I still don't care. That's okay, but you gotta make a choice, and here's the thing, you're gonna be like these people, you're either gonna believe him or not. There's no middle ground. You can't say, uh, I'm neutral, I'm Switzerland. You're either gonna believe or you're not gonna believe. 
And every time Jesus is brought up in reality, you either have to trust him or reject him, one or the other. And so we're gonna give those who don't have that relationship an opportunity, and the rest of us, man, here's the thing. I pray that for 2023, that our hearts are in a place where I wanna know him more. I'm reading this, and I wanna have that close relationship with Jesus that he has with the Father. I wanna develop that, I wanna work on that. And we can, by drawing close to him and by trusting him. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I thank you, I thank you for your word, I thank you for the challenge that we have here, and the fact that Jesus challenges us. And I do pray that, Lord, as we, as we think about your word, and we think about this conversation, and everything you said in this conversation, that we would desire that closer relationship with you. That, Lord, we maybe have some obstacles we've put in way and maybe even believe some of the lies from the enemy. And, Lord, we need to change. And, bottom line, we need to repent. And thank you for the gift of repentance. And now we want to just walk with you, enjoy you, and come to that place where there's that closeness between us and you. So I pray right now for believers that we would be in that place, that, that, just that quiet place where we allow you to look at us and examine our hearts and we begin to understand you know us by name because you love us. And I'm gonna ask everyone, stay in that place of prayer. And if you are here today and God is speaking to your heart, Maybe you're here for the first time, maybe you're here for the 200th time, but you're here and God is speaking to you right now about the relationship you don't have. Well, you need to change that. And you can change that real simply. Jesus was very clear that he came to die for the sheep, give his life, and he gives his life, or he gave his life by going to the cross, and all you have to do is trust him. And I wanna encourage you to do that right now. So here's the thing, if you're gonna have that relationship, it has to start with honesty. You gotta be real with God and honest with God. He's gonna be real with you. And so to be honest with him, you have to come to him, admit to him that you know you're a sinner. That's where it all starts. And it's not for him to know, but it's for you to bring that honesty into the relationship. You gotta admit that you know you're a sinner. Shouldn't be hard. The Bible says we've all sinned and we don't need to go over specific sins because we know we've sinned. I think every person alive knows they've sinned and here's the thing we may not understand. When you sin, you offend a holy and righteous God. Some people say we shouldn't talk about that but that's the reality. You've offended him and now what you deserve by offending God What you've earned, the Bible says, is eternal separation from God. And in that eternal separation, you are going to suffer the wrath of God for eternity. I know some people say that's ugly, nasty, you shouldn't say those things, but that's reality. That's the bad news. The good news, Jesus came, went to the cross, and when he says he gave up his life, as he was on that cross... He suffered the wrath that you deserve that I deserve. When he cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? He was getting that wrath. He was receiving that wrath that we all deserve. And now today for you, because he took up his life again, for you today he says, trust me. I want you to believe that I took your punishment and now your punishment is made in full and I want to give you life and give it to you abundantly. So if you want to do that, say this prayer with me. And you can say it out loud. You can say it silently. If you're backslidden, man, come on home. Come on front slide and say this prayer with us. If you're watching online, you can say this prayer with us. You don't have to be here, but you need to be sincere. So say this prayer. Jesus, today I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you, God. 
And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. And today, I'm asking you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I want you to come into my life and guide me. Today, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.